Hello and welcome to the Kuimungi Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education and Outreach, and on behalf of our Board of Directors, our advisors, our volunteers and supporting members, we want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, the Kuimungi Institute is an independent nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and the human experience following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist, Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And our focus is reflected in three main areas, experience, education, and exploration. We respect the path of academic balance, the creative pursuit of science, while advancing, conserving, and restoring a direct experience of the deeper human connection to all of life. And as an educational institution, we take an open approach. So we invite scholars in related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. That's what we call this conversation for exploration. And on these weekly Sunday discussions, we've had a full spectrum of topics from neuroscience and anthropology, archaeology, astronomy, philosophy, psychology, mythology, shamanism, on and on and on, from the arts to the sciences and everything in between. And we invite you to visit our website at kuyamungainstitute.com. All of our presentations are free. And as a nonprofit, of course, we invite you to become a supporting member. And we thank you, the community members who continue to support the mission of the Kuyamunga Institute. What is it about circles, spirals, cycles that fascinates us? When we look to the artwork of the ancients, we almost in every early civilization, we see spirals as one of the most common geometric symbols painted, carved throughout the world, throughout time, up to the present day. It's encoded in our very DNA. We have long recognized this relationship between the cycles of the universe and the evolution of humankind. There's a sacred union. Today, we're pleased to continue our conversation on cycles with Ray Tomes from our biological rhythms to the life cycles of consciousness in every aspect of our everyday existence, we can see cycles. Just as the earth, moon, sun are in constant rotation, so too are the atoms and the molecules in our own bodies. It's reflected in all of our physiology, our sleep cycles, our breath, our heartbeat, even the cycles of life, death and rebirth. Well, um... The first time that Ray Tomes from the Cycles Research Institute uh, joined us, he talked about it, his own harmonics theory of the universe. And we've often talked about in this forum, we've often talked about how the universe must be one symphony. Uh, each of us handed instruments that were all playing in harmony, in sync with the heartbeat of the cosmos. We can say that mythically, we can say that metaphorically, but it's really fun to have seen some demonstration of it. I'm sure there's cacophony as well as a structured symphony to dance um, to in the universe. This order versus chaos has long been noted, but it also means that we too are tuned to, by design, by evolution, we are tuned to some beat frequency, just like all living creatures also, not only to the universe, but to this planet. We're tuned in ways that we don't even understand completely. I think that all of life must have these extra receptor sites. We're in transmission and receiving mode constantly with some larger hand. So I think that we can um, look at cycles and see another line of evidence for this. We see Earth cycles affect life on Earth. Look at the baby turtles, not just for humans, but baby turtles that catch uh, on the sand under the full moon, which lights their way as they scurry down to the safer zone of the water. I mean, we can see so much, but there's ways uh, that people who, like Ray, have really dove deep into cycles that have uncovered uh, even more of this. So the Milankovitch cycles that drive the Ice Age, Earth has this cycle of tilt, rounder or more elongated orbits. That's just one aspect of this nested egg of cycles. It dramatically affects our climate, which dramatically affects life. So uh, large to small cycles within cycles. So we are tuned. We are tuned to our cosmos. We're tuned to our earth. We're tuned to our bodies. We're tuned to what? Is it the magnetic 
feel? I mean, what is, where are these cycles delivered? Where are we hearing the heartbeat of all of these cycles? And once we detect them, we have to ask, how do they impact us? Are we tuning forks, wanting to sync up with these other cycles? Um, what about the famous experiment with a hundred clocks ticking at different rates? Mm. Very soon, they're synced up to a single beat frequency. So can we manipulate cycles to our optimum functioning? Can we find within our own circadian rhythm how we can tweak that? You have long tried to make me a morning person. Um, <laughs> he's, he's halfway succeeded. So, and how does it behoove us to be aware of the cycles that we generate or to subject ourselves to, knowing that it may influence some other cycles within. Mm -hmm. I think it's a science that we need to be more aware of. Are there's just, that's just one dynamic. What, what are all the others? How do we study cycles within our own physiology? Um, night, day, circadian rhythm, our heartbeat. You mentioned atoms and molecules. Uh, the Schumann residents, our guest is going to talk about the Schumann residents and our brain frequencies. Are they tied within it? And is that mere coincidence? How do we rule it out? How do we know when it's a direct relationship between cycles? We're going to ask him, what are the shortest cycles that have been detected? The longest cycles, the most surprising cycles. <laughs> so... Uh, he does have a Wobbly Universe YouTube. He's got a blog in the Cycles Research Institute. He shares freely with all of us, and he's here to tell us more about cycles within our own uh, system. Mm. Hi, Ray. Thanks for being up at 6 a.m. New Zealand time to join us. Hi, Laura. Oh, Hi, Paul. Nice to see you again. All of those to, questions and much, much more. Much, much more. <laughs> I want to point out that Ray and his wife are also artists, and these are his own uh, watercolors that you see behind him. Yeah. So I hope we get to see a little bit more of your arm. One's mine, one's my wife's here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, welcome back. Yeah, it's nice to be here. Um, you say that among your, um, your YouTube channel, the one on our own bodies, chakra yeah. systems, our own, you know, we're just a, a symphony within ourselves of cycles, within cycles, is among yes. your most popular. So yes, yeah, of course, we're interested in us. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so... Um, uh, the um, it, this came about in several ways. At one stage, I realized that um, the Schumann resonance, about eight cycles per second uh, around the Earth, the electromagnetic wave going around the Earth, uh, is right in the middle of our brainwave frequencies. And I thought that can't be a coincidence. So I, um, I, I just assumed that it must affect us in that way. And I began to look at, um, and, and the, the speed of that resonance around the Earth it's, it's simple to work out. It's the circumference of the Earth um, mm -hmm. combined with the speed of light um, because electromagnetic waves are, are that. And you can work out the circumference and it works out eight, about, that works out about 7.5 per second. It's actually slightly more than that. Um, so the same thing applies in a human body, except the speed of light is not the right one. What's interesting in the human body are nerve impulses. And um, I tried oh, to find, I, I searched on the internet for the speed of nerve impulses, and it's very hard to find right information. But a friend um, who had a medical person said, no, there's, there's lots of different ones, but the two most um, important ones are about one meter per second and 150 meters per second. Mm. And um, the one meter per second, it's interesting because I'd found several other people that talked about a speed around about that. There's a guy, I think his name was Wagner. He did, he did stuff on trees. And he found that, for example, on a, on a tree, uh, that, that if you put a, an impulse somewhere, um, traveling, he found 96 centimeters per second, so very close to a meter per second, uh, that will travel, that wave will travel up the tree. He called them W waves, possibly because his name starts with W, but he also, <laughs> worked, and, uh, and it's, quite, uh, it's, quite, it's quite correct, if you calculate these W waves from the center of the sun to the surface, it gives you a period of 22 years, which is the uh, sunspot cycle. We often call it 11 years, but the poles flip every second time. So it's actually um, a 22 year cycle. So when I use that one, um, if we assume that there are nervous impulses in our body, uh, if we take from that tip of our top of our head to the bottom of our feet and back again, uh, that works out at about uh, taking about um, three and a bit seconds, three and a half seconds or gives you a frequency of 0.3 hertz. And that's the delta rhythm. So when we sleep, that's the thing that goes on, which I always assume, and I think other people do as well, that that's the thing that's sort of processing all the 
stuff of the day and trying to integrate it into into our minds and so on. So mm-hmm. then if we start to look at what about if we take our head or our brain or one hemisphere of the brain, uh, and when you do all those, you start to get all the other common rhythms that are observed in brain waves. Uh, so this seems to be something going on if we look at the dimensions of things um, and the speed of the oscillations. Um, so, I just want to remind people, you're going to be speaking in centimeters and meters, and meters are about three feet, so uh, yeah, trying to yeah, translate yeah. and try to imagine this. A, a um, meter is just over, just over a yard, so a little over one yeah. yard per second, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, you know, we're used to thinking in terms of mediums, like the magnetic yes. field or the biosphere yes. or the atmosphere. When you have a frequency, does it need to have, does it need to beat within the same medium to affect us? Or why? I mean, yes. there's only so many values that we're going to find. How do we know that just because there's a value here and a value here, that they're actually interacting or influencing one another? Right? Yeah, well, there's ways of doing that. And just a couple of days ago, I found a paper published by someone that said that um, the um, the Schumann resonance, they, they, they tied the Schumann resonance up to people's brainwave activity. Um, and they had a number of different people all around the world, and they found all of them were equally influenced by uh, the Schumann resonance. But they then went on and looked at a whole lot of other geomagnetic variables as well, um, including the speed of the solar wind, which, by the way, is about, hang on, we'll do a conversion, 300 miles per hour, 300 miles per second, right? It's very fast. Um, and uh, lots of other variables that are to do with the Earth and its magnetic field and the sun and so on that all of them showed um, good correlations with um, human brain major activity. So this is showing us very much that the thing that lots of us came to conclusion of, but which scientists didn't necessarily, they may have thought it was a little bit flaky. It shows it's very real. Uh, the cosmos is affecting us all the time and everything, um, our thoughts, our actions, all of those things. It's a very pretty thought, right? To know that we're in some kind of creative womb of the cosmos right that we're all yeah. tied together that there's some underlying sense of reality and in fact when we talk with ashok gangadeen right. uh, uh, later on he's he's also looking for the what is the underlying matrix of reality mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. we've long been on that quest but but i i want to and i know advisors among us are going to say but be careful about adopting an idea because it fits your preconceived notions or that it's pretty yeah. and comfortable so I just want yeah. to ask, drill down a little further. How do we know? Give us some more evidence. I mean, you lightly touched on this theory, um, yeah, human well, residents and brain waves. Some, what what some is examples. the connective tissue here? Yeah, well, some examples. If you take um, that one meter, that just over a yard per second, um, um, nervous impulse, mm-hmm. if you start looking at the dimensions of the human body, I mentioned that the, our height there and back gives us the delta rhythm and the parts of the brain give the uh, other brain waves. If you take, for example, a, a, around the person's chest, um, that gives you, um, that goes around about um, just over once per second, which gives you just over 60 times per minute, which is the typical um, heart rate. And when I've talked to people, um, one young lady said to me, oh, that's why my heart's faster. It's because I've got a smaller chest. I said, yes, that's right. And of course, if you look at the heart rates, uh, an elephant has a very slow one and, and, a, and a mouse has a very fast one. It's all related to that. And when you start to look at other parts of the human body, you start to get these other things as well So um, that come up. So, so you're saying so, the dimensions of our body are yeah. part, I mean, the, the beat only has to go height and width to make a cycle. Mm-hmm. It's only geared to that. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? The height is the most important yeah, Where the natural boundary line in this cycle within it is, t- is okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, Even though I don't know general, that every impulse I, I have goes from my head to my toe. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, especially when you, when you sleep and you go into delta rhythm, that's what, it, that's what it's doing. It's doing your whole body. Um, mm-hmm. At other times, um, and the type of thinking that we're doing goes to these smaller and smaller areas in the brain, and that's why it goes faster. Um, I've, I used to belong to the Theosophical Society, and they 
they talked about much faster brain waves than what the, the um, scientists normally talk about. They normally talk up to about, well, they used to stop at about 20 or something. They go to 30 or 50 or 100 now. Um, the Russians go up into the thousands. But um, my belief is that, in fact, um, when you get when you get right down into it, into the tiny structures of the brain, that we actually have cycles going on that are in the, in the millions per second and more. Mm. Mm. And that would be that brain spirit, waves? That would be, what would those, what would they be? Well, they would be brain waves, but do you know the first thing they do when they take one of those things and um, start putting it on a monitor? Yeah. They, they, filter out, they filter out all the high frequencies and call them noise. Ah, mm. oh, interesting. So, so you've actually got to do that, but uh, mm. the higher frequencies won't be coherent. Um, mm -hmm. Depending on the type of thinking or activity you're doing, uh, then those ones will dominate the higher frequencies um, will only make sense, particularly make sense, if people are doing spiritual practices, then they will start to become more coherent. Oh. Um, now, this is my um, supposition or belief to some okay. extent, uh, because I've done Vipassana meditation and I've experienced that you can actually get much faster waves in your brain. I can't mm. tell you how fast they are, but I can tell you that they're incredibly fast. Oh, that's, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, also, yeah. we spoke with uh, an EEG uh, expert, and he said, you know, you're really only getting a centimeter, mm. and you're really only getting, I mean, just a glimpse and yeah. a tiny bandwidth of what all the activity yeah. is. Right, right. There's much more going on that we cannot yeah. detect or see. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> Get a comment. Oh, I was going to say, right, continue talking in metrics. Uh, Tony, who's an advisor uh, for our institute, said, don't make him start oh, you know, didn't ask. interpret. We just, we just, just mentioned so people could follow the conversation. So, you know. But yes, uh, it's, it's as time. a scientist, he needs to hear it in metrics. Yeah, okay. So let's have a look at um, this this video that I made that's, um, that was a popular one. Okay. Um, uh, well, it's not that I'm not going to look at the video. I'm going to show you some um, pictures out of it. Yeah. Australian friend who's a surfy, he calls himself Mountain Man, um, he said to me, you've got to apply this to the to life. I said, no, no, I'm just trying to work out the formula for the universe. Life is too complicated. <laughs> um, and so, okay. uh, but, but I, I took it to heart and I went back and I said, okay, what happens if we make, in this case, we've got, um, this is, um, is he called, not Vesuvius, um, what's his name, man by Leonardo da Vinci. Oh, and so, Vitruvius man. Vitruvius, Vitruvius man, thank you, yes. Um, and you can see I've got the largest wave there going from the top of his head to his feet. And I've magnified the upper part. And you can see, and that's the first harmonic. Now, harmonic series says this, the most important ones are 1, 2, 4, 12 in terms of the, the harmonics of the anything. And so 2 gives you the base of the spine or the genitals when you can see the one that's halfway there. Um, 4 gives you the heart, line of the nipples as well. Um, and so um, that's that, that division. And then 12 gives you those red dots there, um, which, are, which you'll recognize as the chakras coming up. Um, most people don't mention the, base, the bottom of the nose as a chakra. But in Vipassana meditation, that's the point that is observed and is very important. And Yogananda says, yes, yes, there's a chakra at that height, the bottom of the nose, bottom of the ears, that height, uh, at the back of the head as well. So, um, and then the Braille one, which is at 124th. So the, the harmonic theory prediction of what those structures would be are, um, are exactly what is observed in, um, in a human being uh, of important energy points. Now, I'm going to try and change to... Um, well, the sacred geometry was exactly what da Vinci was trying to demonstrate with this, putting him in a, a circle in a square, right? Now... This is showing the, the, the number of the, acu the acupuncture points. Um, you will notice that there's layers there, very regular, although occasionally there's a gap. Um, if you take a, the Buddha referred to this fathom long body. Fathom is two yards. I'm going to I'm going to talk um, imperial here, two yards or 72 inches. You can see that these layers are an inch apart. Um, when we look at some of the other um, ones, when you look at the back, um, it also corresponds more or less to the um, to the, the spine and also to the ribs. Uh, we're made of inches. Uh, the um, if you look at our hands, you'll find um, the joints come more or less in inches. Um, if you look at our face, we've got two inches. Let's turn this off again now. Um, stop sharing. 
Now, if you look at our face, it's, it's from the chin to the mouth is two inches, from there to the nose is one, from there to the middle of the eyes is two, from there to the eyebrows is one, and then there's more up through, which is up there. Uh, and that division. So inches is, what is an inch? It's 170 second, and that's one of the strong harmonics in the human in the human body. So now go back to those, um, the, the chakras for a moment. If you take the uh, Schumann resonance, if you take this wave going from the head to the feet, as I said, that will do it at the delta rate, gotcha. um, and you um, impose the Schumann resonance on that, um, it will make those waves which are th that I showed as the chakras. So that's intimately linked. Huh. With those okay, things so together. say that again. Say that again. Yeah, so we'll put it this way. That whole body one I said takes about three and a half seconds and there's 12 chakras. You divide that in. Uh, what did I get? Um, times that. It will give you, it gives you the spacings of the, the chakras. The mm -hmm. nerve and pulse speed from one chakra to the next um uh, the rate at which that's fluctuating is the same as the as the human resonance you know, okay so, so this brings up a real question i've long had okay so if you take your hand and you say this is one unit you can also see the fibonacci series right yeah two-thirds to one-third roughly yeah. is the fibonacci is pi so which is why we wore our um nautical shells yeah. right perfect fibonacci's so why would that be? Why would nature evolve us to be in those proportions? We understand yeah. that ancient people understood the golden mean, this proportion, yeah. it's in our art, it looks beautiful to us, it looks natural, because it reflects the universe that that evolution yeah. has created, right? Well, because that, that... we see it, it's beautiful. Yeah. It's just natural. Music sounds better in those proportions. Space so you... feels better in those proportions. Yeah. But what constructs those proportions? The, the golden proportion does show up and the, the, the height of our navel it, it divides our body in the golden proportion. That's, that's true. The other ones, when we talk about one, one two, three, five, and eight, which are the early Fibonacci Sequence. numbers, yeah. those numbers occur naturally for a lot of other reasons. So not all the things that occur for that reason are um, due to the golden proportion or the Fibonacci series because in the harmonics, two, two, four, eight, three, six, and five, they all occur in 12, especially all occur. And 12 is not a Fibonacci number, the next one is 13. So um, I, I think some of the things people identify with uh, mm -hmm. Fibonacci are not correct. People have done things that show the, have shown, for example, that the planets uh, are something like uh, ratios of, um, of that series. But in fact, if you do a statistical test, it doesn't fit. Um, the, the inner planets and the outer planets are, are two series that are actually um, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, uh, and distances of Sun are very near the proportion of one, two, three, four. They're not, not the ratios that they say. Um, and Jupiter is a half on that one. So those those things um right we're trying to impose patterns where maybe there yeah, there isn't yeah. a pattern right. or this there's other mitigations to yeah. uh, to a dynamic right so again yeah. pretty pictures we really like to make ordered pretty pictures we do. yeah you've got to but you've got to test these things to see if they really are significant doesn't yeah. always yeah so also i'm i'm curious about the degree that a, a frequency or a cycle um impacts us it, it yeah it for a, for, um, for a cycle from one thing to influence another thing, um, yeah. the, the, the best condition, the most important condition you can have is that that resonates within the thing. So like the singer in the wine glass, you can sing any note you want to your heart's content. You're not going to break, the break glass a glass a, yes. unless you get exactly the right frequency. Um, so that resonance is the important thing. So every uh, system be it physical or uh, anything like the economy. In the economy, there are feedbacks and so on that cause uh, cyclical activity. Right. And those things, um, the, the, the period may not be fixed, it may oscillate out a bit, but if the universe is sending a wave that's in the range of that frequency, it will get synced to it. It was something you said before, they, um, the people getting synced up, right? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Okay, well, here's an example in real life. So they say famously, right, I'm from Seattle, that the, the bridge did not yeah. fall until enough waves lined up 
to amplify the effect and then throw exactly. it so out of kilter. And also, we have a friend from New Zealand, um, John Glennie, and he, uh, early on, this was decades ago, his catamaran flipped in the middle of the ocean through a rogue wave. This was before that science really understood that huge rogue waves could happen in the ocean. And it's again yeah. about the, the trough and the wave lining up. And suddenly he describes a freight train crum, uh, coming at him in the middle of the night in a tiny catamaran in a, mm. in a vast ocean and he's flipped. That he didn't even have EPIRBs back then. It was so early on yeah. that this happened. Yeah, but yeah. now they understand rogue waves. Yeah. They yeah, understand the, tsunamis, the, right? They, for a long so. time, uh, sailors reported these rogue waves, and yeah. the scientists said, no, 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 that's not possible. Not possible. And as usual, the scientists were wrong um, <laughs> because they got to measure them. And these waves are much bigger than they uh, expected to be by random occurrence of random waves. Um, yeah, quite right quite because fantastic, because yeah. overlay and amplitude and and suddenly yeah it goes yeah. out of yeah okay. Go I ahead. mentioned my surfy friend, uh, and I went to visit him in Australia, uh, and spent about a week with him there, and we looked at different things, and we got data on the waves coming in uh, outside Sydney Harbour where it's you know wild weather and stuff, to, to analyse those waves. But also um, because he likes to surf each morning, I went down and watched him surf, and. Yeah. Um, uh, I had talked to him about the 160 minute, the 80 minute, the 40 minute, 20 minute cycles. And uh, when we, when those show up in these waves that we've got, um, the shorter ones of those do, and also three and six minute waves. Uh, he said, oh, the 20 minute waves are well known to surfies. And um, he said, when, when, once we've caught one, we know when the next one's coming. And we go out further because the next wave is going to be bigger and from further out. And, and that comes in, we catch those. And while I was there, we were there about half an hour. One came early in the piece and I noted the time. And, um, and sure enough, just over 20 minutes later, the next one came. He was out there waiting. The, all the guy, all the old, long old surfies were out there catching that wave. Yeah. Huh. I remember talking to, um, an er you know, trying to predict earthquakes. Oh. And so many different theories tried. And we talked to one researcher who was looking at the syzygy with the full moon. It doesn't happen every time, but he was trying to argue that enough pull, if the moon lines up at the right time, it's pulling on the oceans. And I don't know, yeah. just maybe one factor of many, though. You can't yeah, really yeah. isolate to just one factor if yeah. it, it is requires... Quite so a number of factors mm -hmm. to yeah. create an effect to then tilt you towards an earthquake or whatever phenomenon. Yeah, earth, earthquakes and shear markets are probably the two hardest things to try and predict. Um, oh, yeah. One of the first cycles conferences I went to was in California. And one of the guys was talking about um, earthquakes. And as you say, that it's related to the moon. It's the tidal things of the moon and the sun combining and all of this. Um, and it depends on the direction, this direction of a fault and we, how you can work out the thing, which one's more likely to do it. But he had this thing, and he could make predictions. And when the earthquakes did occur, it was when his thing predicted it was more likely to happen. But it didn't happen every time, you know, so well, he wanted God. a way to, to cut some of them out. And um, his friend said, oh, um, you know that animals go all silly when there's an earthquake coming, don't you? He says, yeah, but he says, I don't want to keep animals in the lab and all that. You don't need to, he says, it's in the paper. He says, what do you mean it's in the paper? I've never seen an index of that. He says, no, he says, have a look. And he showed him that, sure enough, um, about, I think it's about six days or around about six, seven days before an earthquake, lots of dogs and cats run away from home. Mm -hmm. And um, they, the, the owners, a day or two later, the owners put advertisement in the paper, has anyone seen my cat or my dog? Uh, anyway, anyway, he had his graphs showing uh, that a, um, an earthquake was due to come up. And he put it up, um, and then he said, here's this morning's paper. And he says, normally there's about 10 or 12 people with lost cats and dogs. This morning there's 52 or whatever it was. You know, it's a vast oh, increase, oh, and that was a very high one. At that stage, uh, a lot of Americans got up and, um, and left there and then to head home. They wanted to get out of California. Uh, but um, they hadn't listened properly because it wasn't due for about five days or so. Anyway, after the conference, I, I got home, and I was um, giving a talk at the place I worked about this, and they and I said, but there wasn't an earthquake. They said, yes, there was. Where were you um, the, the day before yesterday? I said, I was on the plane coming home. They said, yes, there was one. <laughs> it's great. So there's, a, right. there's a really old book called When the Snakes Awake, right? I used to have a copy of that, and it would talk about the various animals that could detect the, the frequency shift. 
See, yeah. so we do have a lot of receptor sites that we are tuned to Earth, mm -hmm. us and yeah. all of life. And I think we must have just turned ours off or something. Right. So it's into oh, my mind several it's into my mind several times already. And when you say when the snake's away, I've got to mention this fellow. It's a series that's on Netflix and I can't remember what it's called, but the guy's looking at all these ancient um archaeological sites. Mm. And um very many of them, um, like Stonehenge is set up, it's um it's an eclipse computer, right? We can come back to that from in a moment, but a lot of these things show the place where the sun rises at the solstices and the equinoxes and so on, um, and, uh, and other things like that. And one of these ones um, in America somewhere is, is a, a snake. It's got a snake wiggling around there that's been constructed oh, yeah. on this huge scale. Oh, yeah, a snake in Ohio, probably. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, um, that's it. I don't know if you've done a, a, a one on the, these things. This guy would be an interesting one to get. He's... Um, he shows that loads of these sites are vastly older than standard dating is saying. Uh, but um, he's got a theory also, which is that there was an ancient civilization that had a catastrophe. I don't know the reason. Oh, you're talking about war. Graham Hancock. You know, it's interesting. I would agree that early on, because it's not rocket science, but it's astronomical science, that we can we can watch the cycles of the constellations and their movement, right, yeah. annually, and then larger cycles among that. We don't we when you're not distracted, when you don't have city lights, you can see the night sky. It's dazzling. When you're not distracted mm. indoors by a television as we are today, you would be watching the night sky. You would be mythologizing the constellations. You would be watching their movements. We talked to William Sullivan, um, The Secret of the Incas, I think was his book. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about going down to uh, Peru and even talking to uh, people today who watch the constellations and yeah. their mythologies are tied to it. Oh, when the llama or the fox uh, dips below the horizon, he's going underground, he dies, he returns. Different constellations, but... Their, yeah. their stories track the movement yeah. of, of the, the skies and, 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 um, and their Ma cycles. Maris. And so why What's wouldn't that? they go back to Lascaux? Mm. People are theorizing that yeah. even Lascaux, the big, beautiful Hall of Bulls uh, mural, you can see constellations. We talked to Frank Edge back in the early 90s, right. wrote a paper about this. There's the Pleiades, right? There's this, there's that. That's he, what he surmised that when you step, when and he went to Lascaux, the and I stood in that place. Mm -hmm. When you, when you, when those one mural of the Hall of Bulls was the morning sky, one was the evening sky of stars. Right. Right. Why not track that? Why not tie it mm -hmm. to your mythology? And why not go back to the Gravettian era? Uh, in the Ice Age. They could see the stars. Why not? I mean, it's just such a yeah. natural impulse. So uh, so uh, my point is that I don't think we need grand monuments to understand how sophisticated our civilizations were. We're going to yeah. have James Herod come on, talk about the Gravedian culture that really spanned from Europe to Siberia to Asia, down later into the Americas. One culture that goes back into the Ice Age, a shared culture with shared mm -hmm. symbols and mythologies and shared sophistication. But it doesn't mean they had to build grand buildings. Right. Like their caves. Oh, yeah, but the, the grand angels. buildings, are, so, as far as I can tell, all the grand it's buildings. It's not the only evidence to have a grand, like, megalithic structure. Right. Right. I, I take your point. There was only one TV channel then, and it was the sky. Um, <laughs> Thank you. you. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. We were all watching um, it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, including but of course, and a they, story would be a way of containing that knowledge. Yeah. 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 The, in, in, the, um, an American guy wrote a, um, a book about um, Stonehenge. Uh, and one, a guy went up to, um, to Fred Hoyle and said to him, this American's written a book about Stonehenge. And he says, well, what does he say about it? He says, he says, he says it's an eclipse computer. Is that right? And he says, I don't know. I haven't studied it. He said, well, you better study it and write a book saying it's not. <laughs> so he studied it and wrote a book saying it is. <laughs> I remember what, Gerald uh, Hawkins, I think you might be talking about. We interviewed yes, him. Yes, that's right. Long yes, ago. Yeah, Gerald yes. Hawkins. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, but Fred found a couple of extra things. Uh, he found that um, um, the, the eclipse, one of the eclipse cycles is called, um, uh, what's the name that one of the eclipse cycle guy that, one of the Greeks? Um, 
it won't come to me. One of the Greeks has got a clip cycle named after him. Anyway, um, so he started studying the Greek stuff. And what he found was that the Greeks um, said they didn't discover the cycle. They got it from the um, mm -hmm. Minoans, mm -hmm. who, of course, got wiped out, and that they knew about it before. Um, mm -hmm. And they, that they said they didn't um, discover it either. They got it from some people who made a big round structure who lived on an island far away um, <laughs> who had come there. And it was actually the ancient Britons who had taken it, taken that knowledge uh, to Manoa, Manoan civilization, who then passed it on to the Greeks and then it came down to us from there and came full circle. But you know, they're finding circles all over, wood hinges Every, as well everywhere. as columns and artwork and yeah, pre, uh, yeah. all of that. Pre yeah. But, yeah. but they nearly all have those alignments. But, but what you, I take what you say is correct, that, that you can um, just watch these things happening. But they mm -hmm. were trying to study stuff that took hundreds of years and so on. Like the precision of the equinoxes, you've okay. got to do these records for a very long time to discover it. You know, yeah. you're going to do it for a lifetime. Um, and and so there's only four things... Mayan codices left. Who knows what was contained in all the many mm. hundreds of books that the Spaniards burned, the conquistadors. Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah. Well, and so that, guys, that to me implies just a culture that endures, right? A culture endures because you'd have multiple generations watching the sky, mm. making yes. note of it, and, and having a cultural container for that knowledge to be passed along, right? Yeah. We, oh, one of the most fascinating talks we had and this shows how readily people were sky watchers and how you can use the natural element you find to sky watch mm -hmm. was uh, Ken Zoll yeah. um, talking about the V-Bar V heritage site like 10 minutes down the road from here. And he's saying, but he's been looking uh, out, hiking around and um, on the solstices, on the equinoxes. And when he sees light shine um, on a rock, often he'll find petroglyphs spiral yeah. petroglyphs yeah, yeah. that either are bridged or yeah. bisected mm -hmm. by the sun's rays yeah. and so there's just naturally occurring stones and configurations they just go mark yeah. them and they know come back and watch yeah so well, I I mean, to... you can find them in very unobtrusive very um yeah. nondescript right, sites right. can be full mm -hmm. of astronomical recordings yeah, I want to tell you about one that I came across um, pictures of and details about in Ireland. Um, and the shape of the thing is like, uh, if I can do this here, it goes, it's it's sort of shaped like this. Hmm. Oh. And I'm down. And then at the bottom, it comes in a little bit and goes down some more. It's, so you could say it's like a Christian cross. But it's actually like a Christian cross with the Very bottom cute. open and a couple more bits sticking down. And oh. another way to see it is it's like a person standing like that. Their head, their arms, oh, their body, oh, and their legs. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing about this one is that um, it's got some carvings around it and inside on the rocks. But only um, on the equinox at dawn, the sun shines right through this passageways inside this thing. It's all covered over. Um, and hits a rock at the top, mm -hmm. um, and it's got a circle with the lines coming out, in other words, a sun um, at the top. Now, um, that's interesting in its own right, but for a person who does um, Vipassana meditation, um, I can see a lot more in that. It's saying at the moment between night and day, in other words, the balance between those two, at the moment between the, the hot seasons and the cold seasons, the balance between the two, mm -hmm. then you'll get lit up at the top of the head. So it's explaining to you, they've left a message saying to get enlightenment, you have to be balanced on all the different things. Oh, all the different that's ways. a beautiful interpretation, indeed. Yeah. 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 Or also, you know, think about New Grange and 20 meter corridor that the light shines in through a light box mm. at the moment. So yeah. to me, it's like, okay, if you have a culture that is used to seeing these in natural rock formations and you want to go and you want to carry some of that magic or that wisdom um, or that sacredness to this spot, you would just create that as well. You would transfer that and make a, a sister site with the same mm -hmm. configuration. So then yeah. you would you would observe. I mean, just the knowledge, just the generations of observation, just the mm -hmm. understanding. Not not to mention yeah. how do you 
drag 20 ton stones over a landscape. So yeah. there's something within the human yeah. condition that does want to duck. I mean, we've been having these discussions with yeah. Professor Tony Hull over the last several years talking about the alignment and just simple stones lined up to different parts of the year, significant points, not all, not only the solstice, yeah. it might be something personal to you, your own birthday or, or some other element in your life that you want to document. So there, we've always done this throughout human history. We want to document, we want to connect. And of course, it's a way when to we celebrate, look, right? When it's we a look, ceremony. When we look to these yeah. ancient societies, of course, it was even more important because of planting and, and, and um, sustenance, mm -hmm. sustenance and that kind of thing. So but also yeah. one interesting aspect of the Vibar V was that they had napped the Sinigua culture of a couple mm -hmm. thousand years ago had napped um, a profile right. that cast the shadow that looks very similar, Ken and his colleagues observed, to the sacred mountains of the um, near Flagstaff. One of their sacred mountains, they wanted to bring again that magic, so you recreate it. In a, in a ritual, you create it in a ceremony, in a symbol that can be activated there. So I think, I think we, I think that Graham Hancock is right in terms of a shared culture. I think Michael Witzel of uh, Harvard is correct in saying there was once a mother culture, a shared culture, and that of course it would differentiate as you got to a new place, new materials, but the same themes that you can see over and over and over again and so you would build circles you would build megalithic markers because that's what your central culture says to do to keep honoring the same themes the same moments in time to activate the sacred so i think we could look at all these things and say they stem from a long-standing impulse and and cultural tradition though they change um, in their adaptations i don't know yeah. Oh, Paul wants to show you well, since, a little bit of that. Um, since Laura has mentioned it several because times. Because it is a there, cycle. We can justify it. It is yeah. a cycle. It's a so sun cycle. This is a re we just attended the, uh, uh, the presentation. Equinox. The Equinox presentation with Ken. So here we see the sun coming up the rock face and the very point of the sun touching the center of this circle, this spiral yeah. notation to let them know. And this was exactly... This was exactly at the time that it was even predicted that that day that equinox would be official, like 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Which Tony or says doesn't count, but well, it, it counted for it me. It counted for me, Tony. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah. I thought I'd throw up that one slide, and so we had a, a, an amazing time of looking at this rock face and seeing just as the sun yeah. started coming up and how it climbed the rock face and made its connection so to that point. So they opened that especially just for the occasion mm -hmm. and there was huge crowd and then you know we're watching it and watching it and ken's talking and telling stories and the moment it happens this collective ah so it mm. still holds that power right yeah. to yeah. watch these so yeah. what a beautiful ceremony to honor the planet the cosmos uh, here on earth it's just such a beautiful gesture um yeah. to activate it so i just want to say the power of honoring these things mm -hmm. Right. Emotional right, right, resonance of right, it. Right. So, yeah. And is that, is that, uh, Ray, something that you find that when you note a cycle, it's kind of like a nod to the universe, a nod to the cosmos saying, I get you. I see it. Yeah. How beautiful. Yeah. Paul, don't walk away. The screen is funny. Don't fix it before you. He's got to go do something real quick. So, yeah, for me, for me, your, um, your screen is flickering a bit. Mm -hmm. Going a little bit jumpy. Okay. That... But I don't know if it's for everybody. It may be because I'm on the far end of the earth. <laughs> He's got too many windows open. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not, I don't think it's coming from our side. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're okay. fine. A few more on the body, and then let's open this up to questions. A few more. Yeah. Like, okay, I've got to ask you. Go we didn't get a chance for Ray really to, we've been having a, a fun bouncing around oh, discussion, yeah. but for Ray to, to lay out that one part of his presentation connecting that human story that, that that the cyclical story from inside tell out. us more about cycles in the body that we don't right. know about you I, I say there's even one important. to do with epilepsy so oh yeah well a friend a friend who um has epilepsy he kept records for many years of every time he had a fit and then um or when he had a they call grand mal the big nasty ones um and i said to him um would you mind sharing your data with me? I can analyze it, you know, and see if there's some cycles. He said, sure. So I did that. And uh, yes, well, there were uh, several cycles. 
Um, the, the article on this is on that um, Wobbly Universe um, blog, by the way. Um, no, no, it's, sorry, it's on the Cycles Research Institute blog. Um, it, it had, I think it had a seven day cycle and so on, which is to be expected that the, the, the weekends and stuff is gonna have some effect. But it had one other cycle from memory, it was 16 point something days, which I hadn't been expecting. It's not a common cycle. Most times when I find a cycle in something, um, more often than not, it's a, it's a common cycle that's, been, that's known before from other things. And this one was a quite unique one. Um, so yeah, so I said to him, can I put it on the internet? Yep, can I mention your name? Sure. And so that's there. Um, but there would be so many other factors. I mean, diet might have a fact, how much sleep well, do you get, how much stress could, is the undergoing? It could, but let me tell you the difference. Um, right? at, the, so. at the peak time of that cycle, if I put, took, took all of the things and took an interval um, of that interval and divided up the whole sequence of time mm -hmm. into that intervals and put them all together, the, the probability of a cycle at the peak part of that was like 10 times as great as during the least day. So there were some days where um, he had a very high chance of having a having a, an epileptic fit and other days where it was an incredibly small chance. It's that big, it wasn't just a tiny variation, it was a huge variation that really surprised me. The probability is a useful tool then because you could say, yeah. if it's going to happen, here are your danger zones, here are your safe yeah, zones. Don't, yeah, you don't, that's right. If, <laughs> don't, 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 don't do the other mitigating factors yeah. that might push you don't over do the edge. Don't do bungee jumping that day. <laughs> like, an earth, like an earthquake, you know. Yeah, like, that's right. Here's the danger yeah. zone. Maybe Saturn's over here also pulling along with the moon. Or yeah, just, well, it doesn't, it doesn't tie into any astronomical cycles that I know of. Mm. Um, and I know most of them. Well, so, the moon yeah. would be an astronomical cycle, but... Um, but what are some more cycles in the body? And also, why is it that the studies that are so interesting, when they put people in a dark room with lights on, so they're not putting dark to light, dark to light to imitate Earth's dark yeah. light cycle, but they just put people in an underground chamber, um, sleep when you want to sleep, they go out of phase with yeah. their natural about a 25, They go about a 25 hour rhythm. Yeah, what is that? What are they responding to? Well, it's strange because and if, it was, more um, and more out if of it was genetically inbuilt, we'd expect it to be less than 24 hours because the Earth's rotation is slowing. So um, in the past, uh, the day would have been shorter. So if it was genetic, we'd expect it to be a shorter cycle. So Earth's rotation is slowing down. Yeah, very gradually. And the moon's it's something of moon's getting closer or what? What is that? No, the moon's the moon's getting further away. Further yeah. away. Okay. Yeah. Those are, those two things are related, by the way. Um, the tidal action of the of the of the moon and the Earth on each other caused the Earth's rotation to slow and the moon to gradually get further away. Hmm. And then, um, what other? Um, what is the? What are the cycles within our body that we? We know about science is yeah. verified, but we're not really that aware of. One day I took my, um, well, you're aware of these ones, but uh, one day I, I took the, um, the microphone for my um, computer and um, I stuck it underneath my thigh, sort of half by set on it, um, and record, press record and um, record a wiggly line. I'm not sure if I've got that one here. Let me just have a look. Well, can you tell us about it? While we're, well, while we're... He's walking yeah, it's, it's, it's It had um, three visible cycles. Yeah, okay. Um, the three cycles were, um, one, there was a very fast wiggle, which got bigger and smaller over a, a, longer, a bit longer interval, which in turn got bigger and smaller over a longer interval. And the three intervals were about eight times per second, so about a brainwave frequency. The next one was um, about once per second, which is your heartbeat. And the next one was multiple seconds, which was your breath. So those three things show up at every point in your body um, as, um, um, well, this was this is sound that's picking up as fluctuations happening there. Uh, so those are the three dominant ones, but there's a lot of other cycles in the um, human body as well. The, the cycles of the intestines pushing stuff through and all sorts of these different things. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't made a full study of those, but things, but. Um, 
Are you picking up like a vibration when you do that? You're picking up yeah. like, okay, the the breath is creating like a sound wave almost, and it's yeah. going yeah. through the body and all the tissues picking it up. So every yeah. cell in my body knows when I've taken a breath. So it's yes, kind of tuned yeah. to that cycle or yeah. a nerve impulse, right? Every yeah. other, it's it's leaving like a rock in the pond, a ripple wave. Right, right, right. So then there's just multiple beat frequencies going on all the time yeah, they're everywhere yeah. different yeah. yeah so we're living in a sea of frequency and in if our That's ears right, could be yeah. tuned to it we would we would yeah. detect these but we're detecting yeah. it in some other way but we're detecting it right? yeah okay and we're mostly you keep, water. You keep saying yes. things that you keep saying things that make me think of mountain man again um uh, he did a little talk for us from a conference we had in america some time ago he couldn't go but he wrote a little poetic thing and it um, it basically said, at every point in the universe, um, waves are coming through from every direction yeah. and at every frequency. Some of them are um, stronger than others. That's, so when we see a star there, there's light coming from that point here. But that's the star over there's light is going through there to somebody else, passing through the same point. So at every point, yeah. all these things are going through it. Uh, and um, it's what you know, what things you're looking at or tuned into. So um, it's it's sort of interesting to see that that see that we are in a he called it a sea of um, of these oscillations. Yeah, we're all there, and if what you pick up for whatever reason frequencies because they're meaningful to me because it helps me um, navigate my world, right? And I'm ignoring. Yeah. I mean, ignoring the nose of noise of all the frequencies that don't apply to me, even though they're passing through me and everything else. Interesting. Yeah. So evolution, of course, would say, well, let's put receptor sites in your apparatus, your earth suit, wh whether you're an animal or a plant or a human, whatever you are. Um, and let's have you pick up those frequencies that are gonna help you navigate or help you regulate or help you um, be healthier, optimize, know when your fertility cycles are and when you should propagate, know when you should go here, go there, right? Know when you should, yeah, do all the things that you're designed to do. I mean, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. I guess the question yeah. is, we are not aware. We haven't yet detected all of them, right. even still... though they're not all coming to us consciously, right? I can see day and night, right? No, it's... I can't see yeah, something yeah. subtler. Yeah, yeah. Cycles. what we can... What we pick up is only a tiny fraction, but of course we've got instruments that will pick up most of the rest. Well, most of the rest that we know about. Well, the um, ones that we know to actually try to right. pick up. Yeah, well, it's yeah that's fun right. To explore that edge between yeah, physics yeah. and metaphysics. It's fun to look to, to witness yeah. speculation, but we have to go there to even understand and yeah. try to find our place in this this whole uh, soup cy cycle, <laughs> this whole cycle of life yeah. that yeah. we're living. Exactly. So. Oh boy. You, you also um, asked me to, that we should talk about uh, climate cycles. Sure. Um, yes, and that's thank a, you. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's an interesting one. So um, the, if we look at the shorter cycles first, um, well, the most obvious things are the day um, and, and the year, and, and the month comes into it as well. But the month doesn't just come into it, be, and the week and the month don't come in just because of the moon, but because of the sun. The sun has... Um, the sun has a, a north and a south cycles. pole, but they're not. Um, the equator is not the point where it changes from north to south polarity. It's actually more like a tennis ball scene going up and down twice as it goes around. So, uh, and that, that scene, that, as the sun rotates in, in about 28 days as seen from Earth, that scene uh, passes right towards the Earth. And that seam is the place where uh, there's um, a neutral effect. And that means that the stuff that's shooting out from the sun at that point is not strongly bent off upwards or bent off downwards. It can come and hit the earth. So we get hit by more stuff from the sun about every seven days. Now, this is not fixed. The number of things in the seam, it's not always four. It might be two or six or eight, but it's most often four. And that does lead to a seven day cycle. And my belief is that the reason that we have the seven day cycle is not due to the moon because the moon cycle comes to 29.5 days, not 28. Uh, and so it's actually due to the sun. And these, um, the climate is affected by this. There is a cycle of about seven days 
Um, you more likely get repeat weather after seven days. And people complain, why do we get so many wet weekends in a row? You know, because that's when they notice it. They don't notice it when they're at work. Uh, so um, that's, but ancient people, of course, did know. So that's why they went for seven days. I mean, and also when, when we talked earlier about the imperial measurement system versus the metric measurement, measurement system, I remember talking to John Michel, um, a, a UK researcher on ancient Western mysticism. And he argued that a foot used to be the, the length of a foot right. and uh, an inch correlated to these metrics in the human body. And yeah. that, that we had uh, measurements that really were tied to human scale and that yeah. we should preserve them for that reason. You alluded to that earlier. Um, okay, I visited some rocks um, north of Auckland. There's um, a beach. Uh, and it's got a huge cliff that's been, the sea has, um, you can see all these geological ages up there, right? right. Um, and there's a flat area and it looks like someone laid paving stones. Um, there's lots of these stones and they are fairly regular sizes, not, not all the same, but you'll get a number in the row the same, then some in a different size. And so I, I used my foot to measure it. I've got some smallish feet and I use my shoes to measure it. And I measured a number of things, and there's a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, I wrote it all down, and I worked out it has got proportions of two and three in, which is common in, in cycles. Uh, about that, um, and it's not, I, had to, I was doing it in metric, of course. Um, and then uh, I realized that was the wrong unit. Um, it was actually imperial. Um, and one of the things is a foot, uh, one of them is a half, a half a yard called a cubit, one of them was a yard. Um, and um, there was um, a hand and, a, um, and other ones, and there was this whole table of them, and all the ones that I'd found had names in the imperial system. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the same thing has been found. Um, a guy named uh, Thom studied the stone circles in Britain, and um, he measured the diameters of them all, and he came to the conclusion that, um, that they had a unit which he called the megalithic yard. And it's, he called, he said it's 2.72 feet. When I analyzed the stuff, I got the same, I got 2.718. Um, so I agreed with him. Um, and that now that one is interesting because when you start going to the larger sizes, when I analyzed this thing for common factors and multiples, it also showed uh, a chain, a furlong, uh, and some other, and a, and a pole or perch, except they were all about 1% less than the modern values for those things. And it was the same with the stuff I found on this beach. So I, I believe all those units in the past were related to uh, things that existed in nature. They exist in humans as well, um, because it's supposed to be this feather long body, but only the tall men are, are six feet tall, aren't they? Um, you know, most of us are a little less. It's What's the difference between a man and a woman? I have to tell you this one. Oh, okay. Because when you come down this thing, you do get to, when you come down from these larger things, you do get to a yard. And at that point, that comes about because when you get a chain at 22 yards and you divide it by 11 and divide it by two and you get, you get a yard. But if you divide the chain by 24, you get 2.72 feet. You get the megalithic yard. Um, and I think um, a man is a furlong uh, hang on, the fathom, a fathom, and a woman is to, um, is a megalithic one. They're related in a proportion 11 to 12. Inter okay, so I'm wondering, were we to have kept this very ancient units of measure mm -hmm. that were based mm -hmm. on nature and the human body, yeah. and it would be so natural that you would, and you do that, I've seen you do that. I wanna know how many feet it is from here to here. Okay, my foot's about it, uh, my foot's about a foot. Let me walk it. I've seen people do that. Yeah. You, would, you would go, okay, let me measure, you know, I'm, ha yeah, I'm yeah, holding yeah. a ruler right here in my hand. That's a span. I'm predetermined, <laughs> right? You would naturally do that. And because people yeah. are pretty much the same everywhere, it would be a common system of measure. You've got the instrument right here in your body. So what are we missing? Because we have changed those, those units of measure. We're not yeah. seeing the correlation that they would have seen or they would have designed. The ancient, it, Greek, the right? ancient Greek temples, they all We're fit into these things as well. Yeah. They all fit into this pattern of sizes as well. Um, it's, it's interesting because like in the Gothic era, 
um, buildings had good proportions. But in modern times, I've been to a cathedral in Auckland, uh, which uh, was designed so badly um, that the roof had came up and it had a thing like that, sort of a, an M shape. Uh, they weren't financed by McDonald's, um, but in this, this, this thing, the result of that is when a choir stood under there and sang, the sound would go up and bounce off these two parts and certain frequencies would totally cancel themselves out because of the echoes of these things. And so it had dead zones. And when and the choirs hated singing there and people hated listening to them. And they had to build a thing over the top of where the choir stands to stop that happening. Now, in, um, in ancient times and in Gothic times, they didn't do that sort of stupid thing. They understood what was going on. So we think that science is making us cleverer, but in many ways, it's making us totally dumb um, because we don't do these things, you know. <laughs> okay, it's making right. us smart in new ways. Well, yeah. Yeah. My argument is that we could retain the smarts in the old ways, as a, in addition to the new ways, and they should be compatible. That's my argument. And the alternative but being that I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The alternative. I like being all that... the tools available to me. I don't want to diss any tool. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, fair enough. I agree. No, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, listen, let's okay, let's go back so... to this concept of weather patterns, uh, weather cycles that we were going so to we're touch on. The longer week. cycles. Yeah. 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 So the longer ones, um, you can detect the sunspot cycle in the weather. That's not so important. Uh, there's a 60 year cycle. Um, 60 year cycle is important. It affects the uh, current that flows up the Atlantic, um, which takes heat from, um, from tropical areas up to um, Britain and other areas there. Uh, and um, it shows up, there's a number of long term um, indices that show the 60 year cycle. Now, uh, Sometimes people get confused about what's global warming and what's the 60 year cycle uh, mm -hmm. because they show you 30 or 40 years data and they think they've got a trend and there is a trend, but it's about to go the other way. So the, um, the 60 year cycle, for example, uh, in America um, in the 1930s up to about 1940 um, was a very hot period. It was called the Dust Bowl. Um, mm -hmm. It's all the, um, uh, partly because of the uh, overdoing one crop in one area um, but, but partly because of the heat, um, a lot of areas got blown away in dust. Now, um, 60 years after that, we get to about the year 2000, when it got very hot again. In between, around 1970, um, it was cooler. And the, at that time, the same universities that now say we've got runaway global warming, were saying we've got runaway global cooling, we're about to enter the next ice age. This is true. You can go and find hundreds of newspaper articles about this at that time, right? Everyone's forgotten it. Um, mm. So um, it's, it's getting mesmerized by a, um, a short term trend. Right. Uh, so if we go back further, uh, longer cycles, there are a lot of other longer cycles, 355 years, 207 years. These ones are happening in the climate. They show up interestingly in the, these two are in the sun and uh, the the sun on the 270 year cycle, this is, this is partly my interpretation of what's happening is the sun uh, has a sort of a blowout every 207 years. It has another one every 355 years. So what happens is that uh, at that time, now that, that these cycles, the 270 year cycle shows up uh, in the carbon 14 records, they can forgot those going back for thousands of years. And that cycle shows up very clearly, both those cycles show up in those records, but in particular, the 207 year cycle shows a sudden discontinuity in one year uh, at those intervals, sometimes, not always. Um, and why that discontinuity is there, I believe, is that the sun at that time throws a whole lot of energy off in a very short space of time, generally in more or less one direction. Um, if the earth happens to be in that direction, we get blasted severely by um, electromagnetic waves. Um, mm -hmm. One of these things was observed in 1859. It wasn't the 207 year cycle, it was a 355 year cycle by one famous scientist. It's named after him, I can't remember what it's called. But, but um, the 207 year one is due in the next, in, in the next decade, in this decade. Um, if it, if it, there's a 25% chance the earth will be in its path when it happens. If it happens, uh, though it, it's all agreed what will happen if one of these things happens when it hits the earth. Uh, it will probably largely wipe out internet, um, power, power supply systems and all that sort of stuff will take a devastating blow. Uh, so um, almost a 
almost an apocalypse type thing. Um, it's not going to kill everyone, but it's going to just um, make a mess Fire of the infrastructure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, so that's those ones are quite interesting for that reason. Um, let's go back to longer ones. There's 2,300 and 4,600 year cycle. Um, and then we get to the Milankovitch ones, which you like so much, 23,000, <laughs> 41,000, and 97,000, and 400,000. And so the cycle, so those cycles uh, are due to, as you know, the, um, the movement of the Earth's axis, um, the wobble of the Earth's axis, uh, and the getting elongated and less elongated in its orbit. Um, so those things can be measured, and they're believed to be due to those. Um, and, um, and on the basis of that, as far as we can tell, we ought to be near the end of this interglacial. Now, mm -hmm. I need to put that in a bigger perspective. We, we live in an ice age. You say, this isn't an ice age, this is an interglacial. But an ice age is a period of millions of years that happens about every um, 296 million years. Uh, we know of at least, we know of three of them anyway. Uh, and then uh, in, during that ice age period, the Milankovitch cycles operate to send us in and out of really bad ice age periods. But even when we come out, we're still in an ice age. The right. temperatures on Earth now are warm compared to what they were um, 20,000 years ago, but they're very cold compared to, compared to what we were 50 or 100 or 150 million years ago. Temperatures were much warmer. And it's interesting to note that all um, all life on Earth has developed mainly during during the last 600 million years, complicated life forms, uh, when on average the temperature's been higher. Mammals have, have come about during the last 60 million years when the temperature's been falling, but when it was much hot, hotter than it is now. So uh, that's the important one. I, I suspect, but I can't prove it yet, but I'm trying to gather enough data to try and find out if this is true, that we're very near the end of this ice age period and that we've done our last ice age and we're not going to dip again, and we're now on the path, temperatures going up that way, um, and that we'll do that for a long time with fluctuations, but that um, we better get used to warmer temperatures. It has nothing to do with humans. It's a natural cycle. It's gonna happen regardless of anything we do. Carbon dioxide is not the cause. You can look at the long records of carbon dioxide and temperature. They are not correlated in the way that people try to tell you, um, and uh, they're not even in the short term. Hmm. Right, your questions. Okay, no, that's I, good. I that's don't good know point. about that last one. That's an oh, interesting theory uh, because there's a lot of theories throwing up. Here's my question is about the Milankovitch cycles. Okay. It always seemed to me, and I take a point that mammals, of which we are, developed in the within the ice age. So we are used to cooler temperatures. We're adapted. Well, no, to they they developed in the warmer periods before the ice ages. Oh okay. Thank you. I meant us. Us. Yeah. Right. I mean, well, we've been well. Humans have been around um, yeah, two hundred. Yeah, we developed yeah. a lot during the ice age. We did. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Just look at the Neanderthals. Um, okay. My question is: It always seemed to me a bit unfair <laughs> that during the Milankovitch cycles create, and I know it's cycles within cycles, smaller wheels, longer wheels, and when they all come together, you have the apex of the ice. But the ice lasts for like 100,000 years. The interstitial mm -hmm. warming periods last for 10, 12, 13, maybe 15,000 years. Yeah. So, I mean, look at that, a 10 to one almost ratio. So it yeah. seems to be a little unfair that we get the nice warming period mm -hmm. is so short compared to yeah. the longer ice age period if you're in the northern or southern climate. Well, some of those past ones are only 5,000 years, yeah. 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 We've already so been. We've already what is been it in, about the okay. the cycles within cycles that lock us into ice? Um, um, well, it's only during that part of the cycle. It, um, during the next um, couple of hundred million years, we yeah. won't have any ice ages. Yeah. Probably. Certainly, after the next couple of after the next million years or so, we will definitely be out of them. Um, and at that stage, there won't be any ice. It'll be it'll be heading up towards what they call hothouse. Yeah. Yeah. And okay, there's been a lot of thought about why, what was the climate condition that allowed dinosaurs during the Jurassic to get so huge? How would they even support themselves in a, in a climate? So that, that's an interesting question. I've heard various debates on that. What's going to yeah. happen to us if we leave the ice age and things are much hotter? 
how and, um, and, the, and the well, ocean levels rise and you know that's more, how more people die from the cold than die from the hot i, I want to know the longest and the shortest cycles that, that okay. have been detected well the the this the 586 million year cycle is accurately measured um, by um, Professor Afanasiev of Russia. It's known by other geologists, but he's determined that period extremely accurately. Um, and that's that's the longest one that we know. There's suspected to be one that's double that and four times that. But we certainly know there's one of half of that and a quarter of that and eighth of that and other ones, fractions of that. Uh, so that's those are what all geological what cycles. What drives that cycle? Uh -huh. um, um, and, well, no one knows for sure. In my view, it's the slushing of the energy of the universe about. Slushing of the energy of the universe. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, you could also say the, yeah. Anyway, go ahead. And what's the shortest cycles we've detected? Um, well, the, um, the cycles, uh, subatomic particles, um, in, in my view, are nothing but oscillating electromagnetic fields, um, and other people have in, believed this as well. It's not the prevailing view. The prevailing view is, yes, they have that, but there's something else to it as well. I don't believe there's anything else to it. Uh, and the oscillation period of those are called the, um, what, are, what are they called again? So even subatomic particles have their, yeah. their side. Of course. Yeah, yeah. So the um, the top quark is the heaviest of the the, the the fundamental particles, and it has a frequency of trillions of trillions of cycles per second. All of them are in that vicinity, right? Trillions of cycles per second. Oh. No, no, trillions of trillions. Trillions, oh, trillions of, of trillions. trillions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. That's just that's just fun to boggle the mind that so way. So that you can call it 10 to the power of 24 if you want. Okay. Around that order. But all of the particles are in that range. Mm -hmm. wow. What I find interesting, Ray, coming back to maybe the beginning of the conversation and that idea of that you're following this intellectually, you're following this from a scholarly point of view, but at the same time, you also recognize the sacred within your research because of being a person mm -hmm. who's a practitioner of meditation, maybe familiar with Vedic traditions and how those Vedic traditions already represent what we're still finding today, that they already yes. knew some of this. And so that's, that's a key element for me in terms of this discussion that really, you know, yeah. propels me and keeps my curiosity going and how you find that connectedness. Yes, yeah, for sure. The, um, there's no doubt in India in ancient times, they believed in these extremely long cycles. We're talking billions of years, you know, um, and they had cycles that are related in the ways that, that I find the harmonics here, you know, relate here, cycles are twice as long as others and so on. And, and that the Buddha also, um, he described the lifetimes of the Vedas, of the Devas, got the wrong way around. Um, and um, he described uh, cycles that um, do, do fit reasonably well with these geological cycles. Um, the ones that, uh, the, the ones in the Vedas um, don't, they're in the same range and they have the similar pattern, but they don't actually correspond, the number of years don't actually correspond with the ones that, um, that I find. Oh. So, um, uh, but they, certainly they were onto something. There's no doubt about that. Just the concept of such long cycles is intriguing to me and ever, however you want to express them, Mm -hmm. mythically or metaphorically or with a scientific measurement or whatever i just think the concepts mm. are interesting yeah right of course they and didn't have they didn't have powers of 10 notation in the buddha's time yeah but someone asked him um does this universe last forever oh it, no it arises and passes away on a very long cycle and they said how long is that cycle and he said well if you take dig a hole and the, using the units of the day it turns out to seven miles by seven miles by seven miles and you fill it with sesame seeds. Some stories have, have different seeds, but sesame seeds is the most common. Um, and you take one out every hundred years. Yeah. When you finish, that's the cycle of the universe. Now I took that a uh, sesame seed is about a millimeter. Um, and seven. And so when I did the calculation, I got 1.4 times 10 to the 23 years. That's 10 billion times longer than the age of the universe according to the Big Bang people. And it's also the same answer I got when I analyzed all the cycles of the pattern of them. It predicts exactly the same value. Wow. I would also say it's a, a word picture 
that is trying to give us a sense of the yeah. imagination to to yeah. stretch our boundaries of something mm. that that vast. I also thought it was interesting that uh, we we attended a talk and watched um, a Hopi elder describe the um, the three worlds or the fourth world. We're in the fourth world. The first world uh, destroyed by fire. Interesting. The second by ice. No, the second by ice. The third by water. And now we're in the fourth era. I mean, that's interesting too. So, so Maybe what do we get destroyed by? that to. Uh, uh, sorry, Ray, I couldn't hear you. Yeah. But let's go on to questions and comments. Well, and just my final comment on what we were yeah. just talking about, and that is, is that maybe from that, that understanding of when we close our eyes in a meditative way, and we all, we explore this area of research internally and finding that connectedness to the outer. So some yeah. of the greatest discoveries happen that way. So maybe as a practitioner of meditation, along with mm -hmm. the research that you're doing, that, that, that the discovery is twofold. It's always feel, feeding each other. It's feeding each point. other. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. I just wanted to bring but that What home. has your deepest, I've got two most profound ahead. moment in your meditation shown you yeah. or, or told you about uh, the nature of reality? Well, um, the well, the deepest ones have come to a place where well, it gets very peaceful until there's actually. Um, it's wrong to call it ecstasy. Um, it's it's uh, beyond that. It's into it's extremely peaceful. Um, I don't get that now, by the way. Um, I get um, um, stuff which is more just tension, mm. um, and that's got to all dissolve. Uh, whether that's happening or not, I don't know. Uh, but in my early days, I I was determined to get enlightened in my first course. And yeah. I went to the I went to the depths and I went to the heights. I experienced um, what's the word that's um, the most horrible state you can be in? Nadir. Um, huh? Nadir. Nadir. Yeah. All right, that is fine. Whatever. Oh, There's yeah. so many yeah, words. Well, the, so. Yeah, no, but it's a sort of like a tortured state, you know. And yeah. I went to a very very blissful state. So I went to all of those. So those. Um, but that was due to the fact that um, uh, I was not wanting that, and I was wanting that, and and it's not wanting and wanting that drive these things. It's the uh, so you've got to get rid of that business of wanting. Mm -hmm. Not easy. <laughs> Let's go <laughs> to some big, questions and some comments. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's okay. Uh, Tony is first, followed by Fred. So Tony, as we mentioned, he's an astrophysicist, scientist, and so I'm sure he has some interesting comments as well on this topic. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks, yeah. Ray. I'm, I'm enjoying this. One of the things I'm hoping to, to I'm trying to collect from your, your comments is what does the aggregate um, collective of frequencies look like? Um, okay. Uh, do, do, you have a chart, do you have a chart that goes from the atto second to, to, uh, to uh, 10 to 30 second seconds or something like that? Yeah. Um, I haven't done one for what's observed because you'd have to get together a lot of stuff, but I've done one for what harmonic theory predicts. Um, I can show you that one if you want. I'd love to see that. Yeah. That's while, good science. While, while Rep Ray is doing this, um, mm -hmm. I picked up this ruler at the recent Astronomical Society meeting. This is the length that light travels in 10 to the minus 9 seconds, 1 nanosecond. So 30 yeah, seconds. Nanoseconds are inches, yes. Is what light does in one nanosecond. I find these things uh, fascinating. And then we have the attosecond, which is about the um, light would would uh, transit a hydrogen atom in one attosecond. That's how how small a number that is. And I think we're measuring down to a few tens of attoseconds now with by miraculous processes that I don't understand. But I, I, I you, you're kind of mentioning this wonderful range of frequencies. Uh, and uh, I'm just uh, very interested in how this all collects when, when you mix everything together, biological, geological, uh, uh, astrom astronomical, the, um, the music of the spheres, all, all this, how it comes yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's certainly, oh, there's huge numbers of them. Um, you have to put it on a log scale, of course, to get anywhere with it all. Very much so, um, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Yes, there's because um, because originally the cycle people studied stuff mostly in the ranges of days, weeks, months, years. Um, but then um, when you start bringing in things like climate and geology, you start racing up towards the millions of years. And when you bring in physics, you race down to the um, as you say, eight seconds. 
Um, I can never remember the names of which ones have how many um, powers of negative 10 in them. But well, um, add on to that again, 10, 10 to the yeah. minus 18. 10 minus 18, yeah. So yeah, okay, so that's sort of the level just above um, the atomic particles, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I would I'll, be really, inter I would be really interested to see if you have on, your, on the log scale as we described, this whole range from from uh, mega years to attoseconds to see w where yeah. these things are. And, and is there a sawtooth pattern or any kind of rhythm uh, that we could see? Okay. This, is, this, is the, uh, this is the pattern that I, um, now the first yeah. line, um, this is the prediction of harmonic theory runs up to 10 to the power of 18. Mm -hmm. The next line from 10 to the 18 to 10 to 36, 10 to 36 to 10 to 54. The last, you should ignore that last, but that um, fades out. Um, and you can see there is a sort of a um, sawtooth pattern to the top of that. There are, is a wobbly bit. Um, now, oh. yeah, the, the I other wonder, thing to I mention is the two bottom layers. I'm sorry, go ahead. The two bottom layers continue on from the top one, but note that they start at 0.8. So there's a huge black area. Um, that black area just gets bigger and bigger. Uh, and that means that there are so many frequencies so close together, uh, it's just no, it's effectively noise, right? But these top ones we can observe and we do. Um, now I'm gonna put that into a different, I'll bring you a different one now. Um, let me find it. Um, Yeah, if, if that was a linear plot, not a log plot, I would be tempted to do a, a frequency analysis and see see what the, the beat frequency yeah. is. I wonder if what it's even worth doing on a logarithmatic plot. A, a, a... Yeah, yeah, well, you can on a log one because this is the um, this is the envelope of that other one, right? Um, okay. The and, envelope, um, yes. So it's showing you the high, where the highest peaks are. And there is a sort of a waviness to it. Not perfectly regular, but um, there's a tendency um, to get uh, cycles about every 10 to the power of four and a half. Um, and um, along there are the ratios at the top, twos and threes and fives and stuff that happen. So I'll get rid of that. And I'll go back to describing that. Now, if we actually look at the large scale of the universe, um, if we take the Hubble scale as the largest scale we can see, then um, and we divide it by the strongest harmonic I get is is thirty four thousand five hundred sixty. Let's call up ten to the power of uh, four and a half, more or less. Uh, when we divide that uh, value into the Hubble scale, we get the typical distance between galaxies. When we divide that again, we get the typical distance between stars. When we do it again, we get the typical distance between planets, then moons, then the next one there's nothing obvious, and the next one there's nothing obvious. The one after that's the typical distance between cells, the next one is between atoms, and then between uh, uh, protons and neutrons. And the following one is presumably between quarks, now or what you people call quarks, depending on where you're from. Uh, so that's, um, that's the structure now. There are secondary scales there as well. So for example, when we say difference between planets, if we look at the solar system, there's actually two scales. There's a scale of the gas giants, which is um, about, about 10 astronomical units. These the four, four outermost planets, if we count Pluto, go 10, 20, 30, 40 astronomical units from the sun, and Jupiter's half of that at five. The inner planets are, are more or less 0.35 astronomical units apart, the first four. They don't fit as well. They've, there's a, some different things that apply to them. Uh, but uh, those two different scales, there's a ratio of 14 uh, between those. Now, that's, that's interesting because um, to, to prove that that's what's going on there applies as we go down through more levels of the structure, the sun and the outer planets are all made of hydrogen and helium at this stage. It will produce carbon later on. Um, and the atomic masses that are, in, are of importance, uh, H1, deuterium, which is H2, helium four, so they go one, two, four. And if you make carbon, it's 12. So, and that's the order that the harmonic series says the important things happen at those ratios. Now, if we look at the earth, the atmosphere is predominantly nitrogen, which is atomic mass 14. 
The crust is predominantly oxygen and silicon, and silicon is atomic mass 28, and the core is predominantly iron, which is mass 56. So it's going 14, 28, 56. The same ratios, doubling, doubling, but um, 14 times as much. And the orbits of the inner planets are 14 times smaller than the outer planets. So I maintain that this is not coincidence. Uh, various physics people I tell me this to say, oh, that's a coincidence. So I say, yeah, I've got lots more of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you're talking about a bell curve, though, within each value. There would be some on this side, some on that side, but you're talking about a bell curve. Yeah, the, yes, there are. Whenever you find a very strong harmonic, yes. there's always other ones at double that um, frequency or period and half of it, a third of it, six times it and 12 times it. No, but it's I mean, within a value, strong there's one. a bell curve. If you're looking from galaxy to galaxy or solar system to solar system, I'm assuming. Oh, the distances? No, the distances, um, the distances tend to be certain quantized values. The, um, th they're not... Um, they're not all the same, but there's multiple values and they are related. For example, um, one guy by name of William Tift, he's not the first one. Someone discovered that um, in a cluster of galaxies, if you've got the red shifts of them all, and they, they quote them in velocity units, so I'll do that because they find that they tend to be different by multiples of 72 kilometers per second. Now, um, that makes absolutely no sense if you believe in the Big Bang, it's, it, it's impossible. Um, but Tiff started making a study of it, and he found, sure enough, provided you took certain precautions, um, there were the galaxies like to be, have differences in, in apparent velocities of 72 kilometers per second. Um, and um, uh, I worked out, you know, I, I worked out that, that this should happen uh, from the harmonic theory, but first of all, I made a mistake because I divided that into the speed of light, and that gave me um, 104, I think. And that, that ought to have been, no, it didn't. Um, when I divided the speed of light by 2,880, which is very strong harmonic, it gave 104 kilometers per second, and it was 72, and it didn't work. And over some time, I was confused by this, and eventually I realized, hang on, Einstein said, you can't just keep adding velocities till you get the speed of light. You can add a velocity as many times as you like, you never get to the speed of light. So what happens if you add, um, the 72 kilometers per second to itself 2880 times and the answer is you get to a red shift of exactly one in other words the frequencies uh, becomes exactly double and then in the harmonic theory that's a very important thing as you've heard me mention many times yeah. so um so i put so i then realized all these other harmonics ought to be there as well um and, and like the 34560 and the 144 and all these other ones so i put a list of them on usenet as it was at that time um, I don't think um, World Wide Web got going properly at that stage, and I put this list. And one guy, um, a lot of people would, um, a lot of people would argue against me in these groups, a lot of the physicists. But the, the ones that um, saw there was something in it didn't support me. What they did is they sent me a private email, and this guy said, "Look up this paper by Tift." And I looked it up, and sure enough, of the tw of the um, twelve values that I had predicted, there should be quantization of um, of distances. Um, 11 of those were ones he had mentioned. Um, <laughs> and, and <laughs> little you know, Ray, that you're not just putting something together until you get the result you want. I mean, what's the baseline well, I, of knowing what, no, what do you no, even I, I had this, these values. You can plug I, anything in. I had said these out. values should exist. Yeah. And Tift, I didn't know. He had already published a thing with that. Yeah. And the only one I knew was a 72. So the, 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 the chances of it happening is about 1 in 10 to the 14. Mm. And the one that, that he didn't have that I had, uh, the one he did have that I didn't have, when I, I uh, the graph I had put as well, it was the very next strongest one. If I'd done 13 values, I would have had that one. Uh, so that's, now the thing is, you can't explain this in Big Bang cosmology. You can't have in Big Bang cosmology things having these velocities. Now, Tift went on to show that if you went to the, took the frame of reference of the center of our galaxy, or the frame of reference that's still relative to the micro cosmic microwave background radiation. In both those frames, the whole sky shows the 72 kilometers per second periodicity. If I, I could just uh, interject, Laura, could I speak? Yeah, please. If, 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 thank you. If I could just interject, there's a little bit of a coincidence here. Um, as a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania in the 1970s, mm -hmm. I invited William Tiff to come and speak. 
on, oh. the, banding, on the banding of red shares, uh, which he did do. So I, I, I knew I knew William Tiff, and uh, and this was a most interesting topic to me at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's funny. One one other talk I gave, I talked about George Williams from Australia, a geologist, about several things, and one of the guys in the audience says he's a friend of mine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so there yeah. he goes. Yeah, I also oh. invited I also invited Jeffrey Burbage to come and speak. Yeah, and, and he gave a talk called "The Riddle of the Red Shifts." Yeah, and and unfortunately, the faculty newsletter left one letter out of Red Shifts. I was in Europe um, some decades ago, um, and I went to see um, Helton Arp. You've probably heard of him in relation to that too. I, 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 know, I know Helton, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, when I was talking to him, I said I wanted to go and see um, uh, Sir Fred Hoyle as well, but unfortunately he died. And he said, oh, there's going to be a conference um, in his memory in um, Wales in two weeks' time. I said, I'm going to be in Wales in two weeks' time. Can you give me the details? So right. I went there. So Geoffrey Burbage was there and William Tiff was there and some others. Um, and one of the speakers didn't turn up. So I asked the guy if I could give a talk as well about my stuff. And um, uh, he said, oh, Jeffrey Burbage will decide. And Jeffrey Burbage's answer was, no, absolutely not. He didn't know who I was, so no way was I talking. It didn't matter that I was going to support some stuff. So I didn't particularly like him. His wife was very nice, and the other people were all nice. But Je Jeff Jeffrey was, um, he treated me the same way that he'd been treated by the um, other astronomers, right, by the establishment. And so he, he didn't learn anything from that. Yeah. Yeah, that's my view anyway. All right, listen, I want to get I want to get some voices. <laughs> Fred Smith's going to join us as well. So, Tony, thank you. Hope we answered yeah, some thanks, of those Tony. questions. And Tony, um, can I say one more thing, Tony? He wanted to Go have ahead. a chat with me sometime. Yes, let's do that. Oh, okay. good. Oh, yeah, thank you. I, I'd be happy to do that. The question of the yeah. equinox is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, thank well, you. Well, I'll tell you my whole Thanks, story. We got to interview him, and I remember him talking about something about the distances between galaxies aren't what is predicted. He had a whole different theory of it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, very cool. Hey, Fred I can explain, Smith. by the way, there. just one more thing there. Sorry, one, one moment, Fred. Wow. Um, I, can, I can explain um, why what, what causes the red shift and so on. Nalika was the man. Nalika is the man to look up. Variable mass hypothesis. Yeah, let's go on, Fred. Hi. Um, yeah, hi. Listen, I my uh, uh, my subject is really classical ancient India. I'm a retired professor, and um, uh, I um, yeah, I just wanted to make a comment on what you on the thing about Indian uh, cycles, Indian year cycles, era cycles called yugas, and um, uh, I have to say that the what you're citing, this one about three three million plus years as a cycle, that's only one of about twenty five different estimations that that have been figured in, in different astronomical and historical and and mythological texts in in ancient India. Um, and first, but before that, I just want to say that that the most ancient civilization of India, the Indus Valley civilization, in what's today. Um, the end of the Indus River in, in Pakistan, throughout the Indus River, and, and and a bit west of the east of that into into present day Rajasthan and Gujarat, the that seem that seems to have been based on a, on an on an eight instead of ten. It's kind of unusual that that would happen, but there was some archaeological, uh, pretty strong archaeological evidence that um, that an archaeologist named um, Walter Fairservice uh, discovered about 40 years ago, but that's seems to have been lost in all of the other Indus stuff that people have been working on since then. But it seems that this, but the everything was built, that the buildings were all built on eight. So you're saying base eight. So they didn't use their thumbs when they were counting. Yeah. They used yeah. they used base eight. Yeah. It's, that appears. I mean, that's it. That was not expected by. Uh, fair service or anyone else, but that seems to be what the evidence brings. Yeah, well, of course, in the Americas, some of them use base 20, so they could count on their toes too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 If, if, what if we had six fingers? We'd have base 12, and then that, yeah, that would be much better. A lot 12, of things work out much better in base 12. 12. Yeah, it'd be yeah. yeah, better, but base eight's good, octal, yeah. <laughs> as we computer people call it. 
Yeah. Oh, there yeah. you go. Uh, I, I will say that this that this there's been cycles in India, uh, the yugas that's four, three, two, one, four, four times the number of years, as it were, for the golden age, the you know, bronze down to the lower era, which we're in now. So that's one. So we're one quarter the amount of time as the as the topmost age morally and mm -hmm. and spiritually and um this has been calculated as 24,000 years 12,000 years millions of years um uh 12,000 years this is all of these different ways that they've been computing this the one that seems to have captured the western imagination is this idea of the uh, th uh three and a half million year thing but that that holds no more other than the fact that it seems to have been something that that was eye popping for scholars yeah. in the 19th century. There doesn't seem to be much more evidence for that than for anything else. Yeah, when I said that they didn't, the long ones didn't correspond to the cycles I know. Um, of course, around 25,000 years is the position of the equinoxes. So the cycles that are based on that they do fit in with um, do yeah. do fit in with um, modern known values. It's the ones that are up in the billions of years that. Um, like there's one of 4.32 billion years, I think, and there's a number of related ones to so that. They don't fit with what's known, but then again, we don't know much about the cycles in that range. Isn't it fascinating that we can look to a culture uh, like India, uh, where they understood the value of cycles and their history and, and the story of humanity, and in this generation, we have a hard time keeping track of a decade of information <laughs> that we, we've forgotten anything before, before the year 2000 doesn't exist. And, and in, yeah. so it's it's such a wonderful reminder and puts us in perspective about the yeah. human story and giving us that yeah. that, that element of uh, of the real story of what's going on yeah. and the importance well, of it. And yeah, there are archivists fashion. we've got are... to keep changing things with fashion. We've got to have new things all the time and yeah. forget the old things. Yeah. So, yeah, I've, I've yeah. spoken to archivists who lament the fact that we're no longer printing out data, we're not having hard physical copies of data, and all the data that we're uh, generating now, so much of it's digital and we won't have devices hmm. in the right. future where you right. can open it or access right. it. Yeah, like I mean, really, yeah. once your iPhone is two years old, it's... Yeah. Absolutely. In, Absolutely. Um, in, in, uh, north of uh, Mumbai in India, yeah, um, the Vipassana um, meditation people have built a huge pagoda. It's copied off uh, Shui De Gong uh, in um, Myanmar, um, and um, it's got a meditation in hall inside that can have eight thousand people meditating at once. But they've also put up these other things, uh, which have got the words of the Buddha um, in all the different Buddhist language countries and all the main and all the common languages of the world. They've got more up carved in stone. Uh, so that's been made to be around for a long time. Yeah. 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 Wow. Any other comments there, Fred? Oh, no, no. I mean, I could I could rabble on about this, but, you know, but I, I appreciate all the work that Ray has really done on this. It's it's, it's incredible, really. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. And thank Tony. And, you know, Tony, you and Ray could have a conversation beyond me. The, the, the mathematics <laughs> go way beyond my ability to comprehend. But I can see the two of you get delighted. Your eyes start to twinkle, twinkle when you start talking about the mathematics and, and all of that. So, yeah. Well, I, I probably bored everybody in chat, but I, I couldn't help but sort of you know, pulse out a few questions. And, and I think Ray and I may be able to continue on that. And, yeah, and well, not, yeah not I didn't get a chance it. to read all of your ones. I read a couple and replied to one or two but um uh the, the others will yeah yeah we'll do that yeah. after yeah. Tony, well, we, you also we, made we, a we, i'm sorry you also made a comment about the u.s government archive and uh do you want to explain that one to show yeah. you how fragile yeah. our this was an archive and they had something like a hundred thousand eight track tapes uh, and of course their last eight track reader died and so they had to spend a million dollars to, to, to reinvent and rebuild an eight track reader so that they have access to, to port this over into a more modern media, which of course is ephemeral too, as Laura pointed out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. and you know, we did this nationally syndicated radio program. I have 10,000 audio cassette tapes. 10,000 audio cassette tapes. And so I'm, I, when I go to a resale shop, 
and I see a cassette deck on the shelf for five bucks, <laughs> I'm buying them. I'm saving up all the equipment I can find. You but ordered it, one to transfer it. Yeah, to I've, got MP3. One, I've got one. I've got one that automatically need. does convert, but even those yeah. are going to go away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But well, I've got files on my computer that come that some of which have been on punch cards. Yeah, um, <laughs> nine, nine track tape. Um, um, I don't think anyone actually can be in on paper tape. Um, they've been down some phone lines. They've um, and they've been on to um, um, eight inch floppies, five and a quarter inch floppies, yeah. um, disk drives, and then um, and then finally into um, storage that doesn't even need disk drives um, <laughs> and all of that. So uh, I, I, I've I kept them all alive. I've got stuff from the sixties. Yeah. And, all that. and yeah. I keep transferring them to the next generation each time. Right. Um, Tony, I would just like to hear the questions that you would ask Ray. He can answer them later. But oh. I just want to understand how your mind works and how, you know, what you want to pull out of the cycle research and why. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. It's very um, fluctuating a lot. The internet uh, went unstable, it looked like. Uh, I questions. wanted to ask Tony, what are the questions? What are the, from the vast database of cycles? What are the ones that are most interesting to you, Tony? And what you want more to explore, and then I uh, and, and without Ray answering today. Yeah, yeah, no time <laughs> today, but just I, I, again the, the diagram that Ray Ray showed. I picked up early on about how brain waves are only monitored about up to uh, to what 20, uh, 20 uh, cycles per second. Yeah, maybe to a hundred. But... And, and 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 some places are doing more. You mentioned that, and yeah. they're discarding everything at a higher frequency as noise. And of course, I immediately wanted to go and do a do a, a frequency analysis of, of that that was being discarded to see if there. Yeah, absolutely. I want to as well. Uh, my, that, please go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I, I want to do that as well. In, in my earlier days, uh, where I knew better what was happening inside myself, um, <laughs> I, I, I really, really wanted to get on one of these machines and take the filters off and see what frequencies were there because. Um, um, I felt like I could switch between a number of different states and uh, up and down, you know, and see what they were. Um, but my, my personal guess is that some of those, um, well, those states are certainly well up in the thousands, but I suspect up into the millions of cycles per second that can be coherent waves. Yeah, the coherent yeah. waves, though, though many recording devices would, would have intrinsic noise, random, random yeah. components that would grow as you went over the frequency it's designed to work to. So, sure. so there are some limitations, but I'm just thinking, well, there might be a signal hidden in the noise. And if yeah. one built better equipment with, with lower noise at higher frequencies, you could, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you could actually uh, sample that. Wow. Yeah. What uh, amazes me is how little we know compared to everything that's going on. We're just getting glimpses, aren't we? I mean, there's so much in this sea of frequencies yeah. and we and are, and it, to me, Tony, it reminds me of the dark matter and the dark energy. We know stuff is there. We just don't have the means to detect it. And so it looks well, blank to our, it. our we, eyes. We, we, we detect it. We just don't, our eyes don't see it, but we detect exactly. it. Exactly. We don't, we yeah. can't decipher what's there. We can't quite open that well, box. We, 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 we do know so. quite a bit of, about it, Laura, and, and we're learning yeah. more and more. It's, it's emerging. Yeah. Okay, so, it's emerging. So, and just it, like the it, cycles it, it, are emerging. Yeah, right. And so I appreciate, Ray, that you're looking at everything. I appreciate that, that you're Ray, trying yeah. to find the cross correlations mm -hmm. because some of them are going to be very significant. They are. They're, yeah. they're existing out Tony, there. Tony? You're seeing patterns in the noise. Yeah. If, okay, uh, if I could just ask Ray one more question. We, <laughs> we have brain, brain waves, and this involves electrodes on, on the head, etc. But I'm very curious about the electromagnetic signals that come out of our body and may extend out uh, this far away type of thing, and, yeah. and and the correlation of those to brain waves, and and do we have different cycles that are seen there? For example, there are heart waves that 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 of course include the beat frequency of the heart, but they include other frequencies, and yeah. and. And this is something that we actually would feel if two people are in proximity to each other. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I used to years ago belong to the Theosophical Society, and they had a number of books that um, yeah. dealt with those subjects. You can probably find them in other places, um, but some of them they actually constructed, you know, pictures around people of where the different um, things came out to that they could detect. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's, it's a whole interesting area of, of study. I haven't got anything particularly I can tell you about that, other than yes, it's interesting. 
Yeah. Well, speaking of interesting, you're interesting, Ray. Thank you so much yeah. today for another great presentation. Tony, of course, always thank you for contributing and keeping us on the, the path of uh, what's known and not, not known. Well, and also, we talked about megalithic markers. If you want to drill down into that, Tony has several talks that are on our YouTube channel. That's correct. Yeah, yeah that's correct. And so, um, more from Ray's Wobbly Universe YouTube and, yeah, and also Cycles Research yeah. We'll put some blog. links on with the, with the so, video. Yeah. Yeah, well, keep on keeping on. I really wanted to see more of your art, but we're out of time. Yeah, Unless you have you. a couple of, do you have a couple of images of your watercolors? I'm just curious. Yeah, I probably do. It might take me a moment to yeah, find them. Yeah, I just want to see this, so, just for the record. Yeah. This has been really kind of interesting because we're tying together this this whole, mm -hmm. this, this whole interconnection of stories. And I think yeah. um, putting this, putting the, the whole concept of cycles into perspective and how it affects us and well, you know, what's interesting, too, is that you talked about the, the deep inside of your meditation in our deep meditative state, a, a our work. Practitioner of the, the postures. The fact that, that we are in tune with the cosmos. We are in tune with the all. We are one with the all. We keep thinking, getting that direct experience mm -hmm. and that message over and over. And so to look at cycles is one way to see just how we're all part of one whole. We're in a sea of one universe we're yeah, we part just, and parcel of it we're it's proponents informing of the us it's guiding yeah. us it's shaping us it's mm -hmm. it's breathing through us it's breathing it's everything so this has been fun to, to see that confirmation right the, and how we're proponents tuned. of the twofold research one the, the science and the outer yeah. and then the inner and the, the two worlds side by side and we, we it's uh, been yeah. dismissed for so long but now it's back on the table as a as a fundamental aspect to research being able to have that direct experience we think it's it's coming more and more into the focus at least yeah so, in yeah. about time oh, and there's something our ancient that's that his jazz oh, wow ray yeah wow. that's incredible yeah that's a yeah. blow up of a small watercolor is it um it's a yeah, yeah, the watercolor is about, um, yeah, yeah, about that size. <laughs> yeah. Do you paint from a photograph? Do you plein air? Are you memory? Um, are you... Quite often from photographs, because sometimes when we've traveled, mm -hmm. when I got home, I, I wanted to do lots of those. So a lot of those, like that one up on the wall behind me and this one are both done from photos. But this, actually, the one I did, from, that I did two versions of that one, one from the photo and that one, by rearranging them because um, I wanted to put them a bit closer together. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just yeah. beautiful work. Wow. That, that, okay. one is, that, one, that one's probably my favorite one because um, a guy who's a master artist, Japanese master artist, um, and it's very hard to get appointed as a master artist while you're still alive in Japan. Oh, yeah. um, I gave that one to him, so he owns that one. So I'm quite proud of that. <laughs> oh, very nice. All yeah. right. Nice well, to see them. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for Ray. The visit. Okay, thank you very much. Nice to see you again. Thank you. Bye. Blessings to you. Take care, my brother.